Okay, so thus far, everything that we've talked about has occurred without energy, just due to the random motion of molecules. The rest of this lecture, for the most part, is about the type of transport that requires energy, and in general, that's called active transport. Anytime movement is occurring from low concentrations to high concentrations, in other words, upstream against the gradient, the only way that's going to happen is if the cell expends energy to cause it to happen. Sort of like if you have a leak in a boat, the water's going to come in without any energy. That's the uh, with the gradient. But on the flip side, if you don't want to sink, you're going to have to expend energy to pump water back out so that you stay afloat. So when we see active transport, we're going to see that ATP is usually involved, and that means you're going to see mitochondria in areas where active transport is occurring. So in this little animation, it's just showing how the phosphate actually breaks off of the ATP, and you see that it now becomes ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, and the phosphate itself is what causes the conformational change in the protein. In this animation, one thing I don't like is that it implies that, in this case, it looks like it's going from higher to lower. And generally, we're talking about things going in the opposite direction, lower to higher, when we're talking about active transport. So the textbook example of active transport is a protein known as the sodium potassium pump. And I have it diagrammed here, it's from your book, and it basically shows that what happens is sodium attaches to the protein, it actually three sodium ions attach to this membrane protein, a carrier protein, from the inside of the cell, and when three of them, they're attracted to it, when they attach to it, the next thing that happens is ATP comes in and drops off its phosphate. When the phosphate binds, that is what actually stimulates the protein to change its shape. And when it does that, you see that the sodiums are no longer attracted to it, so they're released. Potassium now comes in, and the, the, um, the potassiums themselves actually cause the phosphate to break off. And when the phosphate breaks off, the protein goes, undergoes a conformational change back to its original shape, and the, and the um, potassium is now released because it's not attracted to the protein anymore. One thing I don't like about this little um, animation is that it gives the appearance that the sodiums and the phosphates are there lined up like it's a carnival ride and they're waiting to get on and that's not what's happening. We still have random motion of molecules but because sodiums are attracted to it, when a sodium bumps into it, it sticks. And so what's happening is a cascade of events, sort of like a domino effect, but it's not that the sodium potassium are lining up waiting to go through. Okay, and this next slide is sort of a summary of what we've talked about. You see on the left all of our passive transport processes. We have diffusion, simple diffusion through the membrane. Then we have facilitated diffusion, which is where things go through the membrane, but with the aid or facilitation of a protein. It could either involve a protein that almost forms like a channel, or it could be a protein that when the molecule binds to it, it sort of causes the protein's tertiary structure to change, so the molecule is sort of carried through. But none of these require energy. Over here, active transport. When you see active transport, usually you're going to see a diagram showing molecules going from where there's more to where there's, um, I'm sorry, where there's less to where there's more, like here, the little, uh, what this is supposed to be the little potassiums, and you notice there's less here, and they're going out in this direction. The sodium's also going from where there's less to where there's more, and you're always going to see something showing energy, ATP, something that's basically facilitating the motion. Okay, so um, this is actually another
as concentration differences. So we have the chemical difference, the concentration that's different, but in addition to the chemical difference, we also have the electrical force, the voltage difference. So opposites attract. We have positive charge being attracted towards the inside of the cell. We also have sodiums being attracted towards the inside because there's more outside than inside. So what happens in the case of ion pumps um, is that they're setting up this, um, I guess, electron potential. Any kind of protein that generates voltage is called an electrogenic pump. So the sodium potassium pump would be an example of this. And another good example of this would be proton pumps. Um, the, the mitochondria inside our cells actually contain a proton pump where they pump hydrogen across a membrane. Um, hydrogen ions are protons. Hydrogen is number one on the periodic table. It has one proton and one electron. When hydrogen forms an ion, it's H+. Plus. That means all it is is a proton. So when they say proton pump, what they're really talking about is hydrogen ions. And it kind of makes sense that mitochondria have a proton pump because mitochondria, remember our whole endosymbiotic theory, that they were bacteria. So this would be yet another piece of evidence that would support the endosymbiotic theory, the fact that mitochondria use a proton pump, which is something that bacteria use. All right, and this little diagram is actually showing um, what's called an action potential. You're not gonna be tested on this right now, but I just wanted you to see that what you have in your nervous system, and this is sort of the whole idea of how your nervous system works, is that you have these gated channels uh, with sodium, more sodium outside than inside, and this is sort of set up by the sodium potassium pump. And what happens is when a nerve gets stimulated, actually it starts down here, when a nerve gets stimulated, the um, sodium gates open and sodium starts flooding in. Why? Because number one, the positive charge is attracted to the negative side, and number two, you have a higher concentration of sodium on the outside than the inside. And when that happens, it basically causes a domino effect, and this, this is basically your nerve impulse that's gonna travel down the neuron on its way to stimulate the spinal cord, go to the brain, stimulate a muscle, where, wherever that particular nerve impulse is headed. So, um, the next thing here is co-transport. Now, co-transport is where um, you have a molecule, and for example, in this diagram, you have sucrose. Now, sucrose itself does not require energy to get into the cell, but notice that what's happening is this particular protein will only carry sucrose across if, in addition to sucrose, hydrogen binds. And because it takes energy, a proton pump, to pump the hydrogen out here, then in, indirectly, sucrose does require energy in order to get into the cell. Because the hydrogens wouldn't be out here without energy going in to pump the hydrogens out there. So this is co-transport. This is where a particular molecule that a cell needs can only be transported in when there's a second molecule attached to it. And in this case, it's hydrogen, but the idea is in co-transport is that it's an indirect type of active transport because the molecule itself doesn't need um, ATP to be transported, but it needs something that ATP was required to get to its location, if that makes sense. Okay, and another type of active transport is called bulk transport. And this is where something bulky, something really large, is taken in or out of the cell. So this is something that's too big to actually just go through the cell membrane or to go through even a protein channel or a protein pump. It actually requires the cell to wrap around it in order for it to get where it's going. And so this also is gonna require energy. So endocytosis is the general word for a cell taking something in by the cell itself actually the membrane wrapping around it, surrounding it, and then come, you know, bringing it into the cell. Phagocytosis is specifically cell eating. This would be, if you were going to see this in a diagram, the little vesicle that forms around it would be around one giant bulky thing, like a bacteria, like an endosymbiotic theory. We were looking at phagocytosis there. The second kind is called pinocytosis, which is cell drinking. And what you'd see in that case is the vesicle forms around a bunch of little things. And the last type is called receptor-mediated endocytosis. And receptor-mediated endocytosis is where the only way the thing can get in is that it has to bind to a receptor, and then the receptor stimulates the cell to then take in the particle. 
So cholesterol is a really good example of something that is taken in by receptor-mediated endocytosis. And exocytosis is basically just the opposite, the cell getting rid of a particle or something like that. Here's phagocytosis, very clear here, big thing. Here, pinocytosis, a bunch of little things. And this is receptor-mediated endocytosis. This could be cholesterol, for example. The cholesterol has to bind to receptors, and that stimulates the cell then to take it in. And so you could have, for example, eat the same diet as somebody else, but maybe your cholesterol runs high, and it's because these um, LDL receptors that pick up particularly low-density cholesterols, which are the bad ones, maybe you have less receptors genetically. Now, you can't pick up cholesterol and remove it from your blood and process it like somebody else that eats the same diet as you. The last section of these notes is about cell 